everyone. Thanks for listening to my presentations. Today, I'll be talking about adrenal insufficiency, that is, Addison's disease. And this will form part two of seven. And specifically, I'll be talking about causes of Addison's disease. If you haven't listened to part one, please kindly check my channel for that, because by the time you listen to parts one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, you will probably need no more questions as per adrenal insufficiency. With that, let's go. In neuroendocrine system, we'll be addressing apotalamin pituitary adrenal axis here. And in that case, be talking about tertiary adrenal insufficiency if the problem is within the hypothalamus. We're talking about secondary adrenal insufficiency if there's problem with pituitary gland, particularly anterior pituitary. But Addison disease is limited to primary adrenal insufficiency, that is the adrenal gland on top of the kidney. Now, Addison's disease. This is a rare but serious primary adrenal insufficiency. It is characterized by hypocortisolism and hypoaldosteronism. In other words, we'll be dealing with low level of cortisol and low level of aldosterone, respectively. Addison's disease has been named after Dr. Thomas Addison, a British physician. Dr. Addison was the first physician who described this disease in 1855. Epidemiologically, one in 100,000 people will come down with Addison's disease. You could see that it's not that very common. It is going to be prevalent among people between the ages of 30 and 50 years old can be found in all age groups, however, but male to female is in equal proportion. I will briefly go over some clinical features here, but I'm going to get full details of symptoms and signs in part three of this series. So when it comes to Addison disease, there will be low blood pressure, that is a potential shock, hypoglycemia, extreme tiredness, abdominal pain, back pain and flank pain, lower chest pain, fever, depression, irritability, and decreased appetite. Still on clinical features, there will be salty food craving, dehydration, anorexia, weight loss, and gastrointestinal tract will not be spared with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There's likelihood of confusion, increased sensitivity to cold, hyperpigmentation, and disorientation. But there's an entity known as a Addisonian crisis. What is that all about? Well, it's an acute medical emergency with a sudden adrenal insufficiency. There will be a massive derangement in physiological processes mediated by the adrenal gland hormones. Mortality is very high here in Addisonian crisis if there's no immediate intervention. Don't worry, I will address all this later on as we go on in the series. When there's a Addisonian crisis, how are we going to know that this is a Addisonian crisis? All the symptoms that I've gone through in the last three uh, slides will all appear here, with the following again in severe form. There will be severe vomiting, severe diarrhea. And of course, that will lead to apovolemic shock, right? With apotension, right? There will be high fever, loss of consciousness, dehydration, 
severe weakness. There will be utter sensorium in the Addisonian crisis. Like I said, sudden. It's going to be sudden. So there will be sudden and severe pain that will be limited to the abdominal region, lower back, or even radiating to the legs. The individual could go into coma and could actually die if no intervention immediately. But I will tell you more about Addisonian crisis in part three. Okay, what are the causes of primary adrenal insufficiency? It could be isolated adrenal insufficiency or polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1. Don't worry about that nomenclature. I will go into details in a bit. It could be polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 2. I will go into details also in a bit. But if it's not isolated adrenal insufficiency, if it's not polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1 or type 2, what else could be the culprit as far as adrenal gland failure is concerned? It could be tuberculosis. It could be widely spread fungal infection. It could be as a result of HIV or AIDS. It could be secondary to syphilis. Adrenal gland could be failing today because of history of trypanosomiasis in this patient. Might be this patient has been diagnosed with lung cancer before, or breast cancer, or lymphoma. There could be a problem today. Perhaps there is fungal infection, and the patient is on ketoconazole or fluconazole. There's likelihood of adrenal failure. Other causes will include refund pain in someone having tuberculosis or other disease that revamp pain is being used to handle. There's a metazone introduced as a genius, fine twine and scissor disorder, fludrocortisone, barbiturates, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, leading to bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, magesterol acetate, implant movement, intermediate, severe inflammatory disease. So I mean, my to 10. I will go into details as per some of these causes as we pro proceed in this series. Also, I'm an mind, material prone, adrenoleukodystrophy. I'll say, matter of fact, I will address that later on. Adrenomyeloneuropathy, as far as genetic influence is concerned. I'll go into that later on. And of course, congenital adrenal hypoplasia. Still on causes, formerly idiopathic adrenal insufficiency is now known to be caused by an autoimmune condition. In other words, in those days, the early medicine you know, up to now in medicine, when we get a point, we don't know the cause, we call it idiopathy. But as research you now progressed and people were finding out the more, what some physicians called idiopathic adrenal insufficiency in the olden days is now referred to as being caused by autoimmune condition. So it could be polyglandular autoimmune syndromes that could be polygandular autoimmune syndromes 1 or type 2. With that, there will be antibodies to 21 hydrosylase and there's possibility of autoimmune adenitis in 70% and that will be found in females. Still on causes, if it is not polyglandular autoimmune, from that nomenclature, it's self-explanatory that poly means many, glandular, so many glands you know, affected by autoimmune condition. So if it is not that, then what can it be? It can be an isolated autoimmune adrenal insufficiency, meaning only the adrenal gland is being affected by the autoimmune condition. 
and that will be common in males. If zona glomerulosa is affected, there will be decreased aldosterone. If it is zona fasciculata, the cortisol response to ACTH will be low. Later on, there will be a rise in ACTH in serum of those with 21 adosylase autoantibodies. Still on causes, when there is adrenal insufficiency and there are other autoimmune diseases, like I've said, polyglandular autoimmune situation, right? It means we're likely going to be battling with more diagnosis at the same time that we're dealing with adrenal insufficiency. For example, an individual diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease could have Graves' hypothyroidism, could have Graves' disease, and could also have type 1 diabetes mellitus. And if you do your thyroid function test, again, it might not be hypothyroidism, could actually be hypothyroidism from Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. The individual could be having gastrointestinal problems, secondary to celiac disease. So, like I've said in many of my presentations, when you have one autoimmune disease at hand, then be expectant. Look out for other possible autoimmune diseases. Polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1. Polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1 is also known as autoimmune polyendocrinopathy candidiasis ectoderma dystrophy. Someone say, uh huh, too big. No. APECED is associated with mutations in autoimmune regulator gene on chromosome 21. And that will be affecting the thymus, the lymph nodes, the pancreas, the adrenal cortex, and the fetal liver. With this, there's an indication that the children of pediatric age group is not left out. Now more on polygandular autoimmune syndrome type 1. We should know this is a very rare situation, recessively inherited and multiple autoimmunities will be involved. HLA-GR DQ genes are involved and actually play part in the type of autoimmune that the affected person will eventually develop. Okay, what are the clinical features of polyglandular type 1? I'll talk about type 2 in a bit, but now type 1 alone. There will be hypoparathyroidism. When we get to type 2, we we'll also find hypoparathyroidism, but it will be greater in type 1 than in type 2. Another feature is chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis of the mouth. Actually, it could go beyond the mouth, affecting the nails and the diaper area, so giving diaper rash in children. That will be the hallmark of polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1, that is chronic mucocutaneous mucocutaneous candidiasis, okay? And that will be the first symptom to appear. And the candidiasis will be recurring. And we're going to pick this in newborn within the first two years of life. Adenine sufficiency will set in later on at the age of 10 to 15. So they will already be in school before they will be diagnosed with disease. Now, there's likelihood of hypogonadism in about 60% of affected people, hypothyroidism, type 1 diabetes mellitus, hypopituitarism, and of course diabetes insipidus. And you know what it means if there is hypopituitarism. It means more, more. It's going to affect hypothalamic pituitary adrenal disease. It's going to affect hypothalamic pituitary thyroid disease. It's going to affect apotalamine, pituitary, gonadal axis. So, so many you know, hormones will be affected, affecting the growth of children entirely. Okay, still on uh, polygranular type 1, but this time around, the non endocrine 
features will include malabsorption syndrome, alopecia totalis or alopecia areata, pernicious anemia, vitiligo, and chronic active hepatitis. Okay, now polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 2. Formerly known as Smith syndrome. So if you search your literature and you're finding information under Smith syndrome, everything you are going to get is all about polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 2. These will majorly you know, have pronounced adrenal insufficiency. Remember, under type 1, adrenal insufficiency will be after 10 to 15 years. But here, we'll be dealing with adrenal insufficiency big time. Autoimmune thyroid disease here will be greater than in type 1. And type 1 diabetes mellitus will also be greater here than in polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1. There will be primary apogonadism, just as we're going to find in type 1 with diabetes insipidus. But hypoparathyroidism and hypopituitarism will be less here compared to type 1. Still, um, polygamia to immune syndrome type 2, the non endocrine features will include vitiligo, alopecia, initial anemia, myasthenia gravis immune thrombocytopenic purpura, surgery syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, matching the two right now, type 2 is more common than type 1. And primary adrenal insufficiency is the main clinical feature of type 2. So, to those of us who are after Diagnosing Arizonian crisis or Addison's disease in anyone, our goal will be to go after type 2. Okay, hemorrhagic infarction. Acute adrenal insufficiency may be due to a bilateral adrenal infarction, secondary to hemorrhage or adrenal thrombosis. This might be associated with Waterhouse Radiation Syndrome, sepsis from strep pneumonia, miseria gonorrhea, Escherichia coli, Haemophilus influenza, or Staphylococcus aureus. Will be secondary to meningococcemia, pseudomonas aeruginosa, and you could make this diagnosis using CT or magnetic resonance imaging. Severe inflammatory disease. This will occur in seriously sick patients who will be dealing with decreased serum cortisol and albumin level. The albumin level could be as low as 2.5 gram per DL or less, and will also likely have basal cortisol level that will be less than 15 microgram per DL of. 413.8 nanomole per liter. And with that, I've come to the end of this very presentation. The next presentation will be published, and that will be part three or seven. Please kindly endeavor to follow all this series one to seven, and by the time we reach seven, you will be fine with any story as per Addison disease or adrenal insufficiency. Thanks for listening. Please remember to share, remember to subscribe. I appreciate it.